We are here for about 24 hours in Philadelphia. And I thought I'd stop at another plant shop that I hadn't been to, and this one's called Vault and Vine. It's a little off the beaten path, right next to a nice little uh, community here with some cool brick homes and slate roofs. And it's uh, got this cool vibe, similar to like Plant Shed in New York, where it has a cafe and plants. Kind of a little gift shoppy vibe, which I think is like totally the way to go, because it's like more of a you know lifestyle type of thing. So the other thing I liked about it when I was looking on their website is that they have a lot of um, artisanal like arts and crafts, a lot of candles, things like that, that would kind of go with your plants. And a lot of them are made by local artisans, which I think is really cool because when you go to a plant shop in a new place, you kind of want to feel like it's part of the scene and part of the scenery, and I think that's one way to differentiate yourself. So these, I wonder if these are local too, Jungle Club, houseplant fertilizer, and then some compost tea bags, something relatively new. Your cocoa coir poles. Of course, if you want your philodendrons and everything to epiprenums to grow up on a cocoa pole. So I see they have this, the pet safe plants here. So that's probably one of the questions that they must get. And this is around like a, a community where there's a lot of homes. So I'd imagine that people come in and say, what are the pet safe plants? Unfortunately, a lot of these pet safe plants are also very difficult to take care of, um, especially if you don't have high humidity in your home. Um, these are the Calathea white fusions, which are all, I think these all have been reclassified into uh, Gupertia, which is a new genus altogether. This white fusion, it was a plant that I had asked about uh, so many years ago. And Gina, who used to work at one of the plant shops in Brooklyn, asked about it and they finally brought it to New York. I'm not saying that I, I was, uh, I single-handedly brought this back into the, the mix, but I had asked about it and ever since at that time, I would say maybe six months later after that, you saw cal uh, Calathea white fusions everywhere. But they really want some humidity and good distilled water. So if we take a look at some of the other ones here, we have these uh, stromanthes. These are actually not been uh, reclassified. These are uh, stromanthes. And then you have these Gopertias, which actually when they get older, they lose their pink marks if you could get them to get older because it's very hard to get mature ones of these. They don't crisp up right away. I think these are some of the hardest ones to actually take care of and make look good. But, um, you know, if you could give them distilled water, I think that in, in a nice, a nice humid environment like it is here, you can't feel that it's humid back here, but we're in a little greenhouse and it is quite humid. So they do talk about um, working with a lot of like local artisans. And so I think a lot of their uh, plant planters are probably made locally. Although I can't tell you whether these are made locally or not. All right, so here's this uh, Cryptantha. I think they're called, um, they call them earth stars or something like that. Not to be confused with the fungus, the earth stars. These are all plants that look like they've been, they've come together so because they're lower light. So these polka dot plants and all these peperomias, these watermelon peperomias, these were really expensive at some point. It was really hard to get your hands on one of these. And then all of a sudden you turn over here and these are the highlight plants. So these are more of the succulents, as you can see. There's a lot of hybrids here. This is kind of cool. This is like um, one of those epiphytic cacti. So even though it's in with the rest of the more terrestrial species, this is more of an epiphytic cacti species. This one I think is called the African milk jug plant. Very cool one, um, has, I believe it's in Euphorbia, it's in the Euphorbiaceae. And uh, if you break it, it has a lot of latex and it's not something that you wanna get in your face or on your eyes or anything like that because it's uh, highly toxic. So definitely not one to be putting uh, next to the plant plants for friendly uh, friendly for your animals and then we're back here and then we see our ZZ plants our black ZZ plants this is something that is really interesting to see because you could see how tuberous 
these plants are. Even if you had just like a piece of that, or even like a leaf, it's uh, ZZ plants are generally fairly easy to propagate. Although I, I have to say I have one, a black ZZ that went totally yellow. Um, not in a bad way, it just is actually variegated. And I tried to propagate that plant and it was very hard to actually uh, have that grow any roots. It just basically rotted. So yeah, not good. Plant sale, everything must go. Everything on this rack. You can see this is kind of what happens to a lot of the Japertias or Calatheas. Don't feel bad, this is largely what happens where it gets these little brown edgings. It usually happens because of the lack of humidity or with watering with uh, something that's not like distilled water. Uh, I mean, all of these look great. I mean, these are just regular old Christmas and Thanksgiving cacti. You know, they're probably trying to sell them because they flowered once and, you know, they flowered for Christmas and now they're not flowering. But I mean, look at all these little, little Put buds. The flower again. Yeah, the flower again. These are like super resilient. How did you fix, how would you fix that? Um, well, luckily these plants, these plants have really good root structures. If you ever like actually take out uh, Jupertias, they have these really thick, meaty roots. So oftentimes you could just cut it back and it might grow back. And you know, when you get a plant- Which looks like it's already happened. Yeah, it looks like some of them are, had already been cut back. Oftentimes when you change, if you give the plant like completely different care all of a sudden and it's, it has a different light, different water, um, the old leaves are just going to die back and look bedraggled. But the new leaves might actually look better and be more well adjusted to the light and the water regime that you're giving them. So sometimes we end up tossing these things out uh, prematurely. So you might want to just give it some time because plants don't like change on a dime like that. So, and then, um, and you know, again, root structures, some plants have uh, really kind of thin root structures, but not plants like this. They actually have really good meaty root structures and the root is still existing. The only thing is you don't want to probably cut off all leaves at once because then you cut off its ability to have food, chlorophyll. Aglionemas, a range of aglionemas. Whoop. Just knock one over. <laughs> and aglionemas generally, out of all plants, are usually fairly expensive. Somebody would see this $23 and be like, that's not that expensive. And I think in this day and age, it really isn't that expensive. But I think these are one of the few plants that cannot be grown by tissue culture. So it actually takes a little longer for aglionemas to kind of grow out and kind of a full, robust plant for sale. Generally, when plants go into tissue culture, uh, they become a little cheaper to do. So you have some alocasias here, your regular Pachira aquatica money trees, your Sansevieria cylindricas, which we just actually did a really awesome snake plant tour with Chad Husby in Florida, and he gave us uh, some tidbits and he said, the cylindricas are actually one of the species that flowers the most for them down in Florida, which is really cool. And then here's um, a gold flame, which is one of the ones you have. I think this is one of the nicer variegated snake plants. I love that coloration. You can get ones that are really deep yellow and chartreuse. that you're looking at like right when you walk in and you have your bird of paradise right here. These are some of your more stately plants. This is a caryota or fishtail 
palm. I really kind of want to get a, a palm for the meadow house, although I've never really tried many palms. So, and then this one's really cool looking. I love this one. This is a Bismarckia. It seems a little dangerous for a small space, but I love the this blue glaucous hue to it and this kind of fan shape. So that's pretty neat. So you have a lot of your um, larger plants, these plants that will grow much larger. So here's your uh, a couple of your ficus here. So these are your figs. Your splenium bird's nest. And then they do a lot of um, bouquets here. So, you know, all your dried flower bouquets, which I'm kind of into, quite frankly. So I like to uh, just go outdoors and pick up some of our grasses outdoors or seed heads because these last forever, essentially. You don't need water. And uh, some plants look better dried than others. I have a couple of these that are dyed a different color in my bathroom and they've been there forever. So I'm, I'm kind of into the whole dried plant thing and I'm getting more into it because I think there's so much beauty there. And I often will sometimes buy fresh plants and knowing that they're going to actually dry really well and then be able to kind of like prolong the use of them. Here's another one. I mean, this is actually a pretty substantial <laughs> ponytail palm. And this is coming off the heels of looking at that massive 30 plus year old ponytail palm that we saw at Dr. Block's house in Florida. I mean, it was incredible. And he had ones that were very similar that were kind of cut. So it had like a Medusa style head like this one. And this one's 90 bucks. So if you would like live in an area where you could actually like put this into the ground and you wait 30, 30 plus years, then you'll see how actually big it gets. Here's some really beautiful um, seropegias. These are probably very valid that we're looking at these now because it's almost going to be uh, Valentine's Day and I could see that this could be a nice little Valentine's, these like sweetheart kind of style heart leaf, which is really nice. And then the begonias. Begonias are one of those few plants that have these really striking leaves and they're not necessarily always bought for their flowers, even though some of their flowers can be quite spectacular. But people usually buy begonias for their leaves and oftentimes underneath it's, an, it's a different color. And there are so many cultivars. So I can't tell you what cultivars these are. This one just says eyelash begonia, begonia moonlight, snow. And then this one is, doesn't even say. This one here, Begonia Paso Doble. So this one has that little kind of like curly cue right here. And then this is a, a cane begonia. So this is like the maculatum type. Yeah, Begonia Crackling Rosy, which is a common cultivar. And it has these nice pink dots, which sometimes begonias only have when they're small. And that's something that we kind of found out when we were doing the uh, begonia tour. And then you have some of these uh, great philodendrons right here. Philodendron Moonlight are those ones that you commonly see like if you're going into a supermarket or whatever, they plant like a bunch of them. And these are plants that generally kind of stay squat and low. You have some of those philodendrons that kind of creep up. Um, this is not one of those. This kind of like stays in this kind of bird's nest shape like this one. And then you have this one's uh, related to the asparagus. Believe it or not, this is an asparagus fern. In, in warmer weather, you'll actually see in, in areas that don't get too cold, you actually see this as a bedding plant, believe it or not, which is kind of crazy. So yes, the asparagus that you eat is actually related to this one. And I think this one's called the foxtail asparagus. But you have your, your philodendron salome hope, they're usually called, but it's in now the matophyllum, it's considered. And then you have a lot of your philodendrons up here and your pothos, these are obviously the ones that are your hanging plants. I think I got uh, smacked in the face by one of these when I was walking in, I don't know if you caught that. <laughs> All right, so we have a treat because the owner wasn't here, but now she's here. <laughs> so tell me what your name is. My name is Diana Baye. And um, where are we? We are in East Falls, the East Falls section of Philadelphia um, at Vault and Vine, which I don't know how to explain what Vault and Vine is because there are so many moving parts. We have 
our retail space, which is what you see here. We have our greenhouses because we are a certified plant nursery. We have our floral section. We do have florists that create handmade bouquets and arrangements. And we also have our cafe section where we have our wonderful baristas. In the retail section where we are, it's mainly local artists and their goods, their wares. Behind us, this beautiful wall here is exit 343. The artist's name is Stephanie. She is local. It is all her own handmade work. They are very witty. It all comes straight from her head. And I never <laughs> I always think it can't get any her better. Her head and her hand. Actually. Her head and her hand, yeah. that is right. I always think it can't get any better. And yeah. then every season when she comes in and she brings new stuff, it just, she amazes me every time. I said, that, you know, this is something I like about coming to shops like this is especially when you source locally, you get like a completely different vibe than if like you went to some other plant shop mm -hmm. and it's kind of like your vibe. But it's nice to see that you have so many moving parts. I mean, I just th think that makes a lot of business sense as well. Like some people are like, okay, we'll only specialize. But as we've seen, I think even through the pandemic, sometimes not specializing and being able to have many tentacles is actually also very helpful, but could probably also be a little bit maddening too. Well, you have to learn how to pivot in this type of environment. Um, sometimes you don't have any control because when you're dealing with a lot of local artists, it kind of whatever they decide to create at yeah. the time. So you just, you don't know what to expect. <laughs> um, but it usually turns out for the best. Yeah. Right now, everyone is doing Eagles themed everything. So everything coming in is green because we won the NFC championship yeah, last here, night. Like, yeah, exactly. I think you guys have a good chance of actually winning. I can only hope. Um, it would make my dad very happy, but um, I mean, we won't talk football because yeah. I will be here all day. I know. But we're in Pennsylvania. It's like kind of a big. I grew up in Pennsylvania, and even though I grew up like towards Scranton, we cheered for the East Coast, not the yes. not the left coast. We're well. NFC, not <laughs> AFC over exactly. here. Although I went to Penn State. Um, oh, for so, some point yeah. in time, so it was definitely you're middle. You're torn. It was the Eagles <laughs> versus the Steelers I out know. there, so it's Philly versus Pittsburgh. So, but we said we're not going to talk football. We're so not going to talk. We're yes, we're going to talk plants. Here. Plants, um, which we have plenty here. Yeah, like I said, we have our two greenhouses, mm -hmm. and we have plants galore on our on our um, retail floor. And one thing I do tell people, I don't know if you heard of like seasonal depression where people get- Oh yeah, seasonal affective disorder. Exactly. Yeah. Sad. Yes. <laughs> and I tell people all the time, you can come in, you can hang out in our greenhouse, which yeah. we have seating, and just kind of, you know, get a little boost. And yeah, get and over it's got there. great light. And the fact that you have a little cafe here, I love that. Like when the plant and the cafe, I feel like that is meant for one another. And I think so too. Yeah. And we actually have additional seating upstairs. Oh, wow. Okay. Which um, we turned into kind of like a little kid's space hmm. because I have children. And <laughs> I need somewhere where I can take my coffee, yeah. sit down and enjoy it but let my children just kind of roam. Right. So we've created a space like that upstairs. We have chalkboard wall, chalkboard floor. Kids aren't allowed to write on the walls at home. That's true. But wow. they can write on the walls Okay, here. so you're really um, giving them uh, bad teaching because when they go <laughs> home, now they want to actually write on their walls at home. You know what? I had mixed feelings about that, mm -hmm. but with my children, you know, one of them wrote on the walls anyway, so I just had to give them the opportunity to have a space where yeah. it was okay. Yeah. So. okay. So you have boundary lines. You're like upstairs, not anywhere else. There you go. Awesome. Well, this is just like such a cool little vibe. I'm glad I came across this place. Uh, didn't know you guys existed, so it was really fun, and I'm only in town for 24 hours, so it was really nice to kind of take a look around. I'm glad that you came here. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. Stay tuned on Plant One On Me for more botanical tours, talks, and how-tos. And if you're looking to further your knowledge on the plant kingdom, then have a look at our various online courses from Troubleshoot Your House Plants to the House Plant Masterclass. Additionally, we have a second channel we started last year called Flock Finger Lakes, where we cover more on outdoor gardening, habitat restoration, agroforestry, and even more. So check that out if that interests you. Otherwise, we'll see you in the next episode.